Thank you, Brady, uh, for leading us. Uh, as we draw our attention to our Bible study for this evening, uh, please join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful um, that we can gather in this place uh, among familiar faces um, to worship you. And Father, we pray that those few songs have done just that. While the words may be familiar or unfamiliar, I pray that us lifting up those words in song have been pleasing to you. That we have offered up those words out of grateful hearts because we have seen your goodness and we have seen your grace and we have seen your faithfulness towards us. And Father, I do pray for all of us here tonight that we would be able to put what we've been through this day, this week, this season on hold. We would hold off tomorrow until it comes. And we pray that in this moment we could meditate upon your word. That we would have the ears to hear. You speaking to us through your word. And Father, I pray that it would open our eyes yet again to how kind and gracious you are towards us. That it would give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. That this time in your word would break us of the patterns of this world. And make us more like your son, Jesus. May your spirit guide us to truth now. And bear fruit in us. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are in a study of First Thessalonians. Um, as is our habit here on Wednesday night. We will take it. Slow, and we will make our way through First Thessalonians. We will reach Second Thessalonians come April. Tonight, in our study of our passage from First Thessalonians chapter two, we will hear about the Word of God and the work of Satan. So it should be a fun night. If you would join me, First Thessalonians chapter two. We've made our way to verse 13, and we will read to the end of the chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. If you're ready for it, can I hear a big, loud amen? amen. Apostle Paul continues speaking to the church in Thessalonica. He says, and we also thank God continually... Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people. The same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone 
in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Verse 17. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Amen to that portion of First Thessalonians chapter 2. Hopefully, you grabbed a handout on the way in tonight. Uh, I'll draw your attention back to verse 3, that first blank on your hand night, handout tonight. The Word of God has authority. I draw your attention back to verse 13. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the Word of God which is indeed at work in you who believe. Paul is thankful, as he is in most of his New Testament letters. The Apostle Paul is thankful for the churches to which he writes. But here, in this note of thankfulness, he gives us a bit more. He's thankful. He's thankful for these believers. He's thankful for this church, but why? He's thankful because these believers accepted the preaching. And here in this passage, if you've been with us, you remember earlier the Apostle Paul names some co-senders at the beginning of the letter. But he often uses the singular I. But, but here in this passage, he, he uses we language. This church accepted their preaching. They received it. They accepted it. But Paul's thankful that they didn't accept it merely as his word or the preaching of his missionary friends. They received it as the word of God. And as we will see more tonight, um, the believers in Thessalonica accepting the word of God led to consequences. They immediately felt persecution and hostility from the people around them. If you were here the very first week of this study, we, we referenced the book of Acts and where we can follow Paul's journey through Thessalonica. And it's in chapter 17 of the book of Acts that we, we get a hint at what's really happening here. When the believers in Thessalonica accepted Paul's preaching as the word of God, they began to call Jesus Lord. If we look back at Acts 17, verses 5 through 9, when we see this actually take place in the book of Acts, when the church in Thessalonica began to call Jesus Lord, they stopped calling Caesar Lord. They stopped taking the word of a man as their authority. And they made Jesus Lord. And they began taking the word of God as their authority. 
Now, Apostle Paul here, in one verse, calls what we call the Bible, the Word of God, not once but twice. The Word of God is actually my favorite title for the Bible because it's very clear. It doesn't need further explanation. It's the Word of God. It makes it very clear. It's not the Word of man. It's not the wisdom of man. And if it's the Word of God, it comes with authority. And if it's the Word of God and it comes with authority, we must respond to it in a certain way. So if you've got your handout tonight, I've given you a little bit of information there. Uh, hopefully the faithful Wednesday crowd knows that when I give you more information, it's really not for your benefit. It's an attempt to speed me up because it's already in front of you, so you don't need me to tarry. It's there in front of you. Okay, if the Bible has authority because it's the Word of God and we have to respond to it in some way, well, how do we respond to it? How do we interact with it? Well, the first point is a bit redundant, uh, but the Bible is authoritative. Well, I already said it has authority, right? Well, if it has authority, it has to have authority for us. It has to be authoritative to me, which means the Bible establishes truth. The Bible prescribes practices and behavior. The Bible is the final authority on matters of faith, Matters of theology, matters of life. It's authoritative, and we must obey it. I, I bring that down a bit, and that second point on your handout, the, the Bible is sufficient. Well, that must be added because, uh, contrary to popular opinion, the Bible's not outdated or old-fashioned. On the first point, it's authoritative, and then here, it's sufficient. It's enough. In even the hot-button topics of today, we're settled in the Bible penned long ago. Our hot-button issues of sexual ethics, sexual identity, racism, marriage, family, anything else we can come up with thoroughly discussed and decided in the pages of Scripture. It's authoritative and sufficient. And then building off of that, it's also effective. The Bible actually delivers upon the promises that it makes. That if we're brave enough and we open up our Bible and we faithfully read it, it has an ability to peer into our hearts. It, it has the ability to convict and judge. It, it has the ability to, to renew and transform. As some preachers have said for a long time, it's not as if we read the Bible. It's actually the other way around, that the Bible reads us. But therein lies a problem. We don't like someone else peering into our hearts. So sometimes we refrain from reading the Bible because it's a little bit too good at judging the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. The Bible perhaps is a, a little too good at pointing out our lack of spiritual depth. But it is authoritative. It is sufficient. It is effective. And then finally I add on there that the Bible leads us to Jesus to read the Bible and not fall in love with Jesus is a tragedy. Uh, to read the Bible and fall in love with Jesus changes your eternity. 
Um, I do want to draw your attention. I, I do want to travel down a rabbit hole. See how fast we went through that? Because the hand's already on your handout. You already knew all that's coming. We can go fast, which allows me to run down this rabbit trail right here. Hopefully you caught this, though. If we were looking at verse 13, and we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is in, indeed at work in you who believe. You may just breeze past that because you're reading that out of the Bible. And you may breeze past that because you hear that and you hear the word of God and and you just immediately, it's not your fault, think about what we're holding in our hands. But we do have to pause for a moment and realize that what Paul references here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is not... The Bible is, we know it. I mean, when Paul's preaching to this church, he's not holding a leather-bound Bible with the 66 books that we know as the combined Old and New Testament. After all, New Testament hadn't even been written at this point. As we've discussed this is likely the very first letter penned in our New Testament. They had no concept of a New Testament. What Paul's actually referencing here is the apostles' preaching. Specifically, they're preaching about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Which should take us back for a moment. That when the apostles showed up into Thessalonica and began to preach the resurrected Jesus, that the believers heard that as the word of God. And when we do a bit of digging in our New Testament, we, we see plenty of evidence that the preaching and teaching of the Apostle Paul was viewed as Scripture from day one. I have on your handout there 2 Peter um, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So just pause for a moment. 1 Thessalonians, written by the Apostle Paul. You know Paul. He was actually a persecutor of the church. Right? Not an original disciple, apostle of Jesus. He was actually a persecutor of the church. was one day on the road to Damascus on his way to get even greater authority to persecute the church. But it's on that road to Damascus that Paul meets the risen Lord who knocks him off a horse and calls him to be the preacher to the Gentiles. That Paul... Someone who didn't know Jesus personally during his life and ministry. Who wrote 1 Thessalonians. We're now going to read verses from 1 Peter, written by Peter. Who did know Jesus personally. Very personally. A constant companion of Jesus in his life and ministry. Peter here, in 2 Peter 3, writing about Paul, says this. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. That's when we all should go, we're not the only ones that find them hard to understand. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own 
destruction. We could go on and on about those two verses. I I bring them up tonight just to reference. Here's Peter, a constant companion of Jesus during Jesus' life and ministry, recognizing that the teaching and preaching of the Apostle Paul was the Word of God, was Scripture from day one. Paul here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, is thankful that when he preached, that the church in Thessalonica received it. Not as a word from man, not as the wisdom of man, but took this preaching of the resurrected Jesus as the word of God. So it's from there... I draw your attention to verses 14, 15, and 16 on your handout tonight. Obedience can come at a cost. Your blank there is cost. Verses 14, 15, and 16. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered From your own people, the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins To the limit, the wrath of God has come upon them at last. It's in verse 13. The believers in Thessalonica received and accepted the word of God. At the end of verse 13, the Apostle Paul says that this word is at work in you, which means that They were actually obeying it. It was actually transforming them. It was actually making them more Christ-like. And then as a result, we get verses 14, 15, and 16, that their obedience to the word of God came at a cost. And here once again, we see this New Testament theme of persecution. Here, Paul makes reference to the fact that in obeying the word of God and facing persecution, the believers in Thessalonica imitated the other churches in the area. They weren't the only ones experiencing this. As we've discussed in previous weeks in this study, we we can now add the churches to this in this area to the illustration, but but we can zoom out and in their obedience to the word of God and staying faithful through persecution, they also imitate the apostle Paul. And you bring it out a bit more through their obedience to the word of God and faithfulness and persecution, they also imitate their Lord Jesus. And obedience comes at a cost. And then in these verses, um, the Apostle Paul gets very specific. And he's saying that they suffered from their own people. And the same things that those churches suffered from the Jews? So you're saying in a a specific area of Judea, there's a specific gathering of Jewish people who the Apostle Paul links to some very specific things. He mentions that this specific group somehow, some way involved in 
the killing of the Lord Jesus and the prophets. They're the ones responsible for driving out the Apostle Paul and his missionary crew. They displeased God and they were hostile to everyone. And that all of this was done in an effort to keep salvation from the Gentiles. He says, all of this, is this particular group heaping up, that's the language of the NIV, heaping up all of their sins to the very limit. And then he mentions judgment. There's a lot of things about that passage that make me scratch my head. Um, I did a lot of reading about it this week and didn't scratch my head any less. But here's believers in the gospel in this given area being persecuted by a very specific group. Somehow the Apostle Paul links to persecution, not only of Jesus, but also the prophets. And you think about this. Here's the group of people being faithful. And it comes at a cost. If they're being faithful, well, first, they have to put down their own will and take on the will of God. That's difficult enough, but worth it. But then on top of that, they're, they're obedient to the Word of God, and with it comes hostility, opposition, and persecution. I mean, Apostle Paul says, still worth it. Man, as difficult as that passage is, what I take away from it is that the cost should not stop faithfulness. There will be a cost. Uh, but that cost, whether it's hostility, opposition, or flat-out persecution, that cost should not stop our faithfulness. And what we will see here in a minute when we finally get to the end of our passage tonight, our faithfulness will be rewarded. And what we see right here in the verses we just read, that opposition to the work of God will be judged. So, so we're in the middle. When we, when we face those moments where our obedience is coming at a cost, as difficult as it may be, we, we can take confidence, we can rest in the truth that our faithfulness will be rewarded and opposition to the work of God will be judged. If that wasn't cheery enough, I'd draw your attention to verses 17 and 18, and your blank there is, Satan is at work. If you're still with me, can I hear a big loud amen? amen. We're making great time tonight, I promise. Uh, verses 17 and 18. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Uh, verse 17, the Apostle Paul makes a reference to his many attempts his desire to be reunited with the church in Thessalonica. 
And while he wants to see them, he also expresses his deep affection for them. We'll see why he has such a deep affection for them in just a few verses. But his attempts, his desire to go back to Thessalonica were blocked. And then he gives us a curious detail with no further explanation. Those attempts were blocked by Satan. You might ask, well, how? Well, we're not told. But he does tell us that Satan blocked his attempts. So that does give us enough of an excuse for another rabbit trail, uh, Satan, a- a- according to Romans sixteen twenty, Satan is one who opposes God. A- according to Second Corinthians two eleven and Second Corinthians four four, Satan seeks to hinder the progress of the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Satan tempts followers of Jesus. Satan opposes God, hinders the progress of the gospel, tempts the followers of Jesus. Well, opposes God, seeks to hinder the progress of the gospel, might at least explain the why, Satan would seek to block the Apostle Paul here. If we follow that rabbit trail a bit more, according to Colossians 2, 14 and 15, Satan is defeated by the cross. According to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 and 25, Satan is doomed to be completely vanquished in time. But yet, Satan continues to attack God's people. Paul knows personally from a passage we've referenced a couple of times in this study already, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So it's with that understanding that Satan opposes God, attempts to stop the progress of the gospel. He tempts believers of Christ, and Paul knows all of this in a very, very personal way, that the Apostle Paul voices the call to us to put on the full armor of God. I've provided that passage for you in your handout. Allow me to read this to you. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. How was Paul blocked by Satan? We are not told. Um, But... He calls all of us to put on the full armor of God. Now, we, we read a passage like that. Um, 
And it might seem terrifying. Some of you were tempted to amen that. We, we read a passage like that. We, we, we hear about the work of Satan. We, we hear about a call to put on the full armor of God. And that, that might frighten us a little bit. Um, and if that fear causes you to take heed to the passage, by all means, take heed to the passage and put on the, the full armor of God. But I, I'd like to think of it in a bit of a less scary way. Um, I encourage you to read your Bible. Um, I, I encourage you to, to pray. I, I encourage you uh, to attend church. Now, if I were to ask you... Um, you know, please don't respond to this rhetorical question. Um, what one of Pastor Jeff's sermons was your favorite? I know, that's too hard. I know, I told you not to respond. Don't, you know, give me a top ten list of your favorite sermons from Pastor Jeff. I'm kidding because I realize that's going to be pretty difficult to do. Not because they're all great, right? We just have a hard time remembering them, right? We just have a hard time remembering them. If I were to ask you, uh, tell me about like your favorite time that you spent in prayer to God. You might have a hard time thinking of your favorite time in prayer. You, you might have a hard time remembering your favorite experience in church. But here's what I say. Every time you were in church... Every time you prayed, every time you studied your Bible, it nourished you. It did. Just like if I were to ask you your favorite meal that you've ever had, you might struggle to think of your favorite meal. But every meal you've had has nourished you. Every meal you've eaten has allowed you to survive to this very moment. So I encourage you, <laughs> by all means, put on the armor of God. Have a regular habit of reading your Bible. Have a habit of praying. Have a habit of, of church attendance. Have a habit of all these things mentioned in this armor of God passage. But do so not out of fear. Do so knowing that every time you do, God's protecting you and providing for you, and caring for you in ways in which you don't even know. It's provi providing for you in ways of which you are simply unaware. And thank God that I'm unaware of all the ways he has provided for me and cared for me. Finally, for tonight... I draw your attention to these final two verses, um, verses 19 and 20 on your handout tonight. Gospel ministry bears fruit. I draw your attention back to 18 and 19. For we wanted to come to you. That's 18. 19. For what is our hope? Our joy or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. There's a reference there to Jesus' return. Uh, we will have much of the latter half of First Thessalonians study discussing the return of Jesus. So we'll get to that in due time. But here in verses 19 and 20, we see why Paul so eagerly wants to see the church in Thessalonica again. For the Apostle Paul, these believers in this particular place provide for him a representation of the fruit of his ministry. It's when he sees these believers, for whatever reason, 
You know, it's one of those things. Did Apostle Paul just say this to everybody? Maybe. Right? But, but, but he's saying it here to this particular group. That, that when he sees them, they are a visible, tangible expression of the fruit of his ministry. And one day, when the Lord returns, and the Apostle Paul is there before his Lord, the, the evidence of his ministry, his fruitful ministry, will be the believers in Thessalonica. They will represent his hope and his joy and his crown. That he was faithful to the call. That he went to the places that he was supposed to go. That he preached the message that he was supposed to preach. And people actually believed. At some point in the future, Apostle Paul is speaking of the truth that we will be evaluated in regard to the stewardship of the ministries that God has placed in our care. Now, I want to be very clear here. Um, Apostle Paul was faithful. And as a result, there was a church in Thessalonica. There are times when our gospel ministry bears fruit that can be counted. And this is what the Apostle Paul references. In the church in Thessalonica, his fruitful ministry can actually be seen. And there's times for that. There really is. To, to rejoice in the visible fruit of ministry. But the, the New Testament also provides plenty of evidence that sometimes gospel ministry bears the fruit of faithfulness. Period. And when we look through the pages of Scripture... We're in charge of being faithful. God brings about fruit. So sometimes, by the grace of God, we are faithful to our call and we get to see fruit. That's why Apostle Paul's so excited to get back to this place. You know, in other places, he's getting run out of town and he preaches and riots start. He gets to preaching and thrown, stones are thrown out of him. But here's a group of people that are actually receptive to his message. He wants to see them. Gospel ministry bears fruit. Sometimes it can be counted. And sometimes it's merely counted by our faithfulness. So when we look at this passage tonight, my, my word to you Is, is draw your attention to the Word of God. And your attention upon the Word of God will open your eyes to the character of God, the, the will of God, and the work of God. And then your obedience to the Word of God will likely lead you to opposition and fruit. But it's worth it. Let me just say that once again. Our attention has to be upon the Word of God, and it's in the Word of God that our eyes are open to the character of God and the will of God and the work of God. And then when we're obedient to that Word of God, it will likely lead us to opposition and fruit. But all of it worth it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for this group um, you've gathered to hear. Um, 
Father, I know they could have been somewhere else tonight, uh, but they are here in our chapel or tuned into this broadcast somewhere else. And Father, I pray that you would reward them in whatever way you see fit for their faithfulness to your word tonight. I pray that this time in your word renews their mind and transforms their heart and gives them a hunger and thirst for more of you. Father, I know present in this chapel tonight and in the viewing audience at home or somewhere else, there is an abundance of need represented by these people hearing the sound of my voice. And Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that you created each person. I'm so thankful that you know them better than they know themselves. I'm so thankful that as we go through the day, it may seem as if no one knows and no one cares. But we're so thankful that you know. And you are bigger and stronger and wiser than anything we face. So, Father, I lift up every person hearing the sound of my voice. I pray that they would feel your presence. Not in some sort of sentimental way, but may they feel your presence because of the spiritual truth, the the, the spiritual reality that you are here with us. May each one of us lean upon you, and may we find you faithful. We hand over our weakness, our ignorance, and our confusion, our our brokenness, our frustration, our our hurt, our our anger, our bitterness, our failure, our, our addictions. We hand it all over to you. We want to carry it no more. We want to see your will in your way, in our lives. Father, there's some of us hearing the sound of my voice in need of physical healing. Lord, I pray that you would heal them because I know that you can. There's some of us in this room experiencing financial stress, emotional stress, relational stress, mental stress, All of it. Uh, Father, I I pray that you would provide peace where there is no peace. That you would provide comfort where there is no comfort. That you would heal the things that are broken. You would restore that which has fallen apart. We confess that you are creator, provider, sustainer, and redeemer. We're so thankful that our greatest need is for eternal life, and we're so thankful that you've provided it to us. If we have nothing, through the cross and the empty tomb, we have eternal life. We're thankful for that. We praise your name for that. Heavenly Father, I do lift up every person on our prayer page tonight. Many people uh, experiencing pain, discomfort, many people in the need of of healing and restoration. Father, I lift them all up to you. I pray to you as the God that knows everything going on in their body. I pray that you would provide healing uh, because we know that you can. So we humbly intercede on behalf of every person and pray for you to work. Heavenly Father, I pray for this group in front of me. I pray that they would get home and get home safely. I pray when the time comes that you would lay your head upon, they would lay their head upon the pillow and fall asleep quickly. 
um, and get a night of deep, meaningful rest uh, because they know you are God and that they rest in you. And may we wake up in the morning eager to seek your face yet again. And we pray all of these things. Um, not in our name, not in the name of this church, not in just any name. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for your presence here tonight. You may have heard on Sunday morning, if you attend the 8.30 service, that Barbara Taylor, um, who has played organ for us for about three decades, um, uh, let us know this last week that she would be retiring. Uh, so tonight in room 109, there is a bit of a reception for Barbara. Um, I bet we're a few minutes ahead of the choir finishing. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and make your way there and partake in a little bit of a reception for Barbara, you are more than welcome. But if you don't see Andre in there yet, don't eat anything, right? We'll <laughs> wait for Andre to get in there. Uh, I'll see you Sunday, if not sooner.